Hey guys, Merry Christmas. Chris and Graham here once again with you. I hope you all are having a great holiday, enjoying the time with the family. Happy Hanukkah, happy holidays, everything that anybody might be thinking. Happy Boxing Day if you're north of the border. Hope you all are having a great weekend. It is Christmas Eve here. We are down to, uh, well, on the East Coast, about eight hours, just under eight hours until Christmas Day. And I managed to procrastinate just long enough to get everything done right beforehand. Battle, how about you? Um, I managed to procrastinate long enough to not have everything done yet. So I'm proud of you. Uh, I got a little bit of work to do after we do the show. Um, I got about oh, maybe 10 or 12 hours until my daughter's probably going to be up and ready to open presents. Yes, she likes to open nice. presents at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's not my fault. It's hers. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, I'm good. Well, you know, I've heard tradition-wise that some families open presents on Christmas Eve or they get one gift on Christmas Eve. I've never heard of people opening gifts a couple of days before Christmas, but apparently the Cleveland Indians didn't get the memo, and they decided to go out and sign the hottest hitter on the free agent market to a three-year contract with a one-year club option for a three-year $60 million uh, signing to bring Edwin Encarnacion back south of the border – into Cleveland, Ohio, and I think make them perennial contenders in the American League for several seasons to come. Yeah, I'd, I'd back off hottest hitter a little. <clears throat> I, uh, I definitely think he's the biggest power bat on the market right now. Um, but Encarnacion is not exactly a uh, light-up-the-bases kind of guy. But definitely, this is going to help Cleveland probably get over that i mean what are you going to call it you can't call it a hump they were you know a couple of outs away from winning the world series on a couple of occasions uh just this last year so uh maybe he can maybe he can help them uh be a few more runs ahead next year and uh help them get over that that little bump in the road that gets them a world series trophy uh, Certainly. I, I mean, we look at there were two teams uh, with more or three teams, rather, uh, the Cubs at 103 and the Nationals and the Rangers at 95 that had more wins than the Indians did. They were 94 win team. Very solid. Uh, I mean, you know, we thought that maybe they were beginning to lose their grip on the central at the tail end of September last year. We talked about it a lot. We thought that both of our picks, the Mariners, and the Tigers had a chance to surpass them, and they were able to kind of tighten the reins and finish strong. As big as the signing is, and I said I think it was a steal, um, not so much in the financial aspect of things, um, but just for, for what you're getting, for what he can do, and, from, and with what he did in a stadium that is certainly a pitcher-friendly park. But to me, the story of this is going to end up being – was this I, was this mismanaged as a whole in the situation by the Blue Jays and by Edwin Encarnacion's agent? There have been a bunch of reports that have come out that said that Encarnacion wanted to stay. Um, things have been a little bit convoluted on, on both sides that the Blue Jays didn't offer a uh, or didn't make an offer until a few days before free agency, and that Encarnacion wanted to test free agency, and that that his agent seemed surprised at how fast they moved, but man, this is a business. This is baseball. You, if you don't have a surefire answer and you have an opportunity to get somebody a la Kendris Morales, I don't see, I mean, it's, you know, and they said there's no hard feelings. It's business, but it sounds like, and what he has said is that he wanted to go back to Toronto. And it sounds like somebody or multiple parties in this dropped the ball and made it an early Christmas for the fans of the Cleveland Indians. Definitely, there was definitely a ball drop, and um, it was it was on the it was on the part of Edwin Encarnacion's manager. I read a report today on ESPN that said that um, the the Blue Jays told Encarnacion's manager that they were going to make a qualifying offer. They asked him for feedback as to whether or not they thought that he felt that Encarnacion would accept a qualifying offer from them, four years, $80 million, which was the offer that they made, um, and received none. 
In fact, they received no answer at all. Um, and I think that that is um, on that, that the problem when you talk about the fact that Encarnacion, Encarnacion's manager's job is to gauge the free agent market, figure out what the, the value of his player is, and um, find the best place for him. But it's also to figure out where Encarnacion wants to play. And Encarnacion wanted to play in Toronto. And if Toronto is going to offer him an extra year on his contract, which is huge for a guy who's going into, the, into a season where he's going to turn 34 years old, um, has a possibility of being still under contract, which is 38. Uh, now he's going into a contract where he's only got three seasons, so he's losing an entire year of baseball, potentially, and $20 million. And I understand that he's going to pay probably half of that $20 million in taxes, uh, in, in Toronto, but yeah, it's still 53 and a half percent tax. Up. I mean, a huge tax rate up there. Right. But it still costs him a decent amount of money plus an extra year of baseball simply because his agent didn't do his job. He didn't gauge the market. He didn't figure out what Encarnacion wanted to do. And he didn't provide feedback to the team that was going to offer him more time and more money than any other team has, or, uh, or in fact did. Uh, at the end, the A's offered him two years, fifty million. It's twenty-five million a year. Um, you could argue that uh, two or three of that's probably going to go to taxes in California uh, per year, but uh, over what's going to go to taxes in Ohio. But um, it's still only two years, and then he gets ends up getting three years, sixty plus million from 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 the Indians, and. The Indians won on this, I think. I think they really, uh, they really uh, made out pretty well as far as getting a guy uh, goes, especially when you're talking about a guy who's going to be a designated hitter. 127 RBIs last season, 42 home runs. If he can keep up that sort of pace and do it in a, in a hitter-friendly park, um, I think that you're probably going to see him hit somewhere in the mid-40s in home runs maybe even push across 129, 135 uh, ribbies. Now, let's not forget that this does still come at a, at a pretty hefty price for the Indians. The new CBA does not kick off yet, so they will lose a first-round pick, and that will end up being the 25th overall pick um, after the Cardinals signed Dexter Fowler and the Rockies signed Ian Desmond. So you, know, you still lose the, the compensatory pick, but here's the big thing now. First thing I will say is we don't know if there was a club option or a buyout option for that fourth year. So that fourth year may still have been null and void in Toronto regardless. So, yes, he may be on paper losing a year of baseball, but there's no guarantee that he would have actually been able to play that year out in Toronto anyway. The big thing for Cleveland, and we've discussed they had one of the lowest uh, revenue or lowest uh, you know, main salaries in the league. I think there were 20 three or 25, you know, out of the, the, the 30 MLB teams that we've got. The big thing, though, is you've got, um, you've got him for the next three years, right? So through 2019. The beauty right now is Corey Kluber, Carlos Carrasco, Danny Salazar. Your main three pitchers are also controlled through 2019. That's the last guaranteed year of an Encarnacion's deal, okay? Plus... You have Kip Nister, 19, and then Andrew Miller and Cody Allen, your two strong relievers, through 2018. So, I mean, they have plenty of pieces right now to make a sustained run. Okay, you've got the bats. You've got the leadership. You've got Terry Francona there, who was a clear players manager, as we discussed, going out of the ALCS when we saw all these guys, you know, chucking and jiving and having fun on the, you know, on the bases during uh, the closeout game in the ALCS. Clearly, they're in a great situation to win now a team that has not seen a World Series trophy in that city. They have been close. They have tasted it. They have felt it snatched away. They know the window is wide open, and they plan on coming through it with a force and a vengeance. And I think we are going to see, for the next three or four years, the Cleveland Indians in the postseason, very, very deep runs into the postseason until about 2020. I agree. Um, this, is, this is something that's going to make, that, that's going to make them perennial. But – one thing that I think that they're going to need to watch out for with Jose Batista is this, this trend of plate discipline 
Um, but Bautista or Encarnacion? I'm sorry, I know, we, I know we're planning on talking about Joey Bats. I don't know if we were doing a quick change. <laughs> oh, no, we'll get to Joey Bats. we got a lot to say <laughs> about Joey Bats. We always get to Joey Bats, it seems like. Um, but – there's, this, there's been this downward trend in plate discipline for Edwin Encarnacion, and it's something that, that, that the, the Indians are really going to have to watch with him. And hopefully having a player's manager, having some good hitting coaches around him might help him with this. But just to paint you a picture, in the last three years, uh, um, actually, I'm sorry, since 2013, so in the last four seasons, three years, um, Encarnacion, in 2013, Encarnacion struck out 62 times, walked 82 times. Then, the next year, in 2014, he flip-flopped those. He walked 82, 62 times and struck out 82 times. And then, in 2015, he walked 77 times, strikes out 99, 98 times. And then last year, he walks only 87 times, striking out 138 times. As you can see, there's a downward trend in, in plate discipline for him. And where that comes in is this is really where you see him start to make that change, where he's not on the field every day, where he's sometimes um, uh, playing in that DH role, where he's not, uh, where he's not going out and uh, putting on the glove and, and getting a feel for the game, not playing every game of the season. Now, he did play 160 games last year, um, and – He's, he's doing all of the things on the field that you would expect Edwin Encarnacion to do. He's still a decent defender, but he's by no means a great hitter, and his plate discipline is disturbing. Um, it's a little bit frightening to look at a trend that's, that's slipping that far. Well, I mean, and to be fair, he played 75 games at first base um, this past year. For Toronto, um, you know, I, I understand your, your point of plate discipline, and, and I, you know, I, I think the main argument that you're making here, and I don't think it's necessarily glaringly wrong, which you know, I mean, it's a new thing for you, which I'm impressed, um, <laughs> is that, you know, uh, the less that you're in the game on a consistent basis, um, you know, it, it, like you said, it's hard to kind of get into the flow, kind of feel where the game's going. I'm not going to go as far as saying that he that he's pressing, but you know, when your only job is to hit, sometimes you're so focused on trying to produce what your main job is that you might be a little bit more aggressive than necessary. Um, the funny thing is, though, out of all that, his on-base percentage has been his highest the last four years, uh, averaging between the mid-350s up to 370, 372 at its peak, and his highest he's had is 384 in 2012. So really his last five seasons have seen him grow in that aspect, and his OPS has gone over 900 the last four seasons. This past season, 2016, was the first time he dipped below 900 on an OPS uh, since 2012. That was 886, so he's still right there. Um, driving in 127 RBI this year, uh, his best of his career, 42 long balls. That ties a career high from 2012. He's been mid-30s and above, and that's, and that's in, a, in a park that we said is not – at all hitter friendly. It's big. It's expansive. It's colder up there. You're bringing him into progressive field. If, if he can translate that, and he already had, I believe, a, a near a four or a five war the last two years. Uh, I mean, that puts the Cleveland Indians over a 100 win team. And like we said, I mean, you know, they had the fourth most wins, I believe, uh, in Major League Baseball this year. It makes perfect sense. So, you know, it's a great signing for them. Yeah, you're paying him a little bit more, uh, well, more than, he, than his numbers probably say he would deserve, but the market, it, it fits the market with which you know, his numbers garner. And if you can get maybe half the season out of him playing defensively for you and get a little bit of extra bang for your buck, I think it's a great move, and I think that Cleveland is going to be a team we talk about for many seasons to come here on the show. No, I agree. And we also got to remember that, that – um, even though Encarnacion's not playing first base every game and he's not playing in the field every game, it's not that so much um, that he's really slowing down too much. I mean, the guy is still able to stretch hits. He's still hitting 30, 30, 35 doubles a season. So it's not just home runs. The guy's still getting over 150 hits a season. He's still 
hitting 30, 35 doubles a season. He had two triples last season. I mean, he can leg out these hits. And this is, those, those sorts of things are important for that 127 um, RBI number as well. I mean, right. And let's not forget, not, Michael Brantley's coming back. And Brentley was considered kind of the wild card as to why the Indians fell short in the World Series. I mean, as strong as they were going in the way that the, the Cubs played early, a lot of pundits said that they thought that if Brantley had been there, that the Indians would have gone ahead and closed that door. So you're going to have him come back, plus you're going to have Lindor, you've got Kipnis, you've got, you know, Jan Gomes is going to be back. You've got plenty of guys on there who now Encarnacion can kind of play safety blanket. So the, the, the moment where we've seen Bryce Harper, he can get pitched around because no one's there. Now you bring in a guy who is a clear power hitter, still knows how to move the ball, and he's going to have a, you know, a, a, a much easier field to move the ball around in and pieces around him that are going to either force him to get pitched to or a couple of other really good hitters to get pitched to. Either way, you're probably going to get burned more times than not facing this Tribe team. Exactly. No, and it's, it's, it's going to be uh, a good year, uh, a good season to watch. They're going to be a fun team to watch, I think. Um, and I think we're going to be really impressed with what they do. Uh, but I'm also impressed with, with another kid uh, named Ender Enciarte, who you yeah, and I from one Native American team to the other. That's right. We're going to go to the, from the tribe to the Braves. Um, and you and I have discussed Ender and Ciarte a little bit. I think we've talked about him on the show as well. When we, uh, when we were talking about the Braves and we, when we did the interview with uh, Chip Carey. Um, but Ender and Ciarte had a lot of pressure on him when he came to the Braves and you you talked about people saying it. I've talked about people saying it. And people thought that maybe Ender Enciarte was going to replace or maybe be the, the second coming of Andrew Jones uh, for the Atlanta Braves. He hasn't quite been that. However, what he has done is he's done uh, quite well as a utility hitter. He, he hit 291 last season, 351 on base, not so great. Slugging 381 is not so great. But, you know, he hit, uh, he, hit a, he hit a couple dingers, but he had 152 hits, which is not bad for only coming to the plate 578 times. Uh, you're talking about coming to the plate 200 fewer times uh, than most guys. He only played 131 games. But he's, he's turned into a good piece for the Braves, who I think, given that this is, this is only his junior year, I think – Going forward, he's probably going to turn into uh, a really, really good piece. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, I don't think at all he's going to be an Andrew Jones type player. I mean, that's a once in a generation talent, and the guy that's probably closest to that right now is Mike Trout. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it is. It, it's a once every fifteen, twenty years you get lucky. You know, I was fortunate enough to, to see both. I've been able to see Jones play uh, live when I was younger. The one thing I like about Enciarte is, you know, the kids averaged. Uh, about 18 stolen bases a season, 19 in 2014, 21 in 2015, and then, and then uh, 16 this past season. So uh, 56 total steals, um, you know, I'm not really in the mood to do a lot of math, but we're averaging right about 13, you know, right about, you know, 19, 20 uh, steals a game just about. So it, it, it's a piece that, you know, they, they could use more speed. You've got veterans in the outfield in Matt Kemp and Nick Markakis. Um, you're probably over time going to see a couple of the uh, uh, Malik Smith as a guy whose name has been tossed around another, another speed guy who you might see a, a bigger role in the outfield. Obviously it's going to depend on how the Braves perform, which there are no, uh, you know, as much as it pains me as a guy, you know, grew up loving the Braves, there's no high expectation for them. They're opening up the new stadium you know, if if they land Matt Weaver's great, we're we're hearing so little out of that camp. We don't know where he's going to go. But for a guy who they really feel can kind of be the general at 25 years old that outfield, uh, and, and it's it's a contract that I mean he's guaranteed just over 30 and a half million. Okay, he gets three and a half million signing bonus, and then I mean he, he earns two million next year, four million in 18, five million, seven million, then eight million in 2021. There's a $9 million option and just over a $1 million buyout. So you kind of get, get control over him, excuse me, 
over his free agent years. You don't have to worry about going into arbitration. Um, you know, I mean, nine homers over in just over 1,100 plate appearances. But the base path is going to be his thing. He's not going to be a power guy. He's not going to be the Andrew Jones who could really rake the ball. But if he can get on base, if he can get on base more consistently and have pieces behind him that allow him to use his speed to his advantage, you know, as we just talked about with Cleveland, why the draft pick hurt so much. It's also why them making all those big signings a couple of years ago hurt so much because they lost all those draft picks. Why the Upton brothers didn't do anything. They lost so much. Now you have a chance for this team to bring in good guys, keep draft picks, and begin to solidify that team and grow it from the inside up. That's how they were such a, such a contender for that decade or 13 years of straight division titles back in the 90s into the early 2000s. Right. And, and let's not forget that Ender Inciarte is a gold glove winner in, in, um, in the field. He's a good defender. He's a strong piece on defense uh, that I think that, that the Atlanta Braves really need. Um, like you said, he's, he's the field general type of guy for the outfield. Um, and I think that this is a really good signing for the, for the Atlanta Braves. But I also think that given, given some of uh, NCRT's pitfalls, this is really good for him too. I think both, team, both he and the team made out really well for this. He gets to stay in Atlanta, show what he can do, grow up a little bit in Atlanta, and uh, possibly help them be uh, contenders for that National League East uh, title, at least. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the contending is going to be a while. I mean, the Mets and, and, and we said the Mets and the Nats are going to clearly be the, the odds-on favorites for a while. You know, if the Marlins are able to actually make decent moves, which we'll see if they ever prove us right on that. Um, but keep in mind, that's also, this also was his first year in Atlanta. He came over in the Shelby Miller trade, which also brought Dansby Swanson, who came up late last year. So we get a chance now to see Swanson play a whole season at shortstop. They're going to get to see Inciarte now who has um, some security in what he's doing. He knows the club believes in him. He knows he's going to be out there, and this is your job. It's, yours, you know, it's your outfield to run. Get him where we need to be, and let's make things happen. You know, you're, you're putting a lot of faith and confidence in these young players. And as Chip Carey said on our show previously, you know, it, it, you're getting a lot of opportunities to see what these young guys can do, where to spend money, and then they get a guy that's – they see a high ceiling for at a young point in his career, and they can tie him up for relatively, uh, you, you know, a, a, a pretty relatively uh, a fair price for what they're going to get. So I, I think it's going to be great. A reminder, guys, you can always uh, hit us up on Facebook, Out of Left Field, hosted by Chris and Graham. Also, please follow the Out of Left Field baseball community, a great place to talk baseball, you know, talk a little bit of trash, talk with us. Uh, also, feel free to tweet us and follow us on Twitter at OO Left Field on Twitter and the Out of Left Field YouTube page, Out of Left Field, hosted by Chris and Graham on YouTube as well. We had a new video that came out this week, which we will get to here in just a couple of minutes, but that, it really has been a pretty busy week um, in, in Major League Baseball. You know, obviously the, the, the signing of Edwin Encarnacion ruled the headlines. Ender Inciarte came out recently. Um, but one that surprised me, uh, and I mean, the price was pretty fair, a guy who really lost his home when Chris Sale was signed. There wasn't a question about that. He struggled mightily last year. We thought that that was really going to be the reason that the Red Sox weren't going to make the playoffs, and they ended up finding Rick Porcello, who stepped up to the plate or to the rubber, if you will, and dominated the American League and took home that AL Cy Young. But Clay Buckholz is on the move from – uh, Boston to the city of brotherly love in Philadelphia. He is now a Philadelphia Philly. Uh, the Phillies trade second baseman, a uh, minor league high A second baseman named Josh Tobias. He will be going to Boston in the swap, and then um, Philly just designated a third baseman, Richie Schaefer, for assignment to clear roster space for Buck Holtz. It, I mean, it, it works. It, it works for both teams. The Phillies are looking for another pitcher. We discussed this last week. They need someone else to kind of help out with that rotation. You get Buck Holtz, who's still relatively young, has struggled. You have to hope he's going to bounce back and perform better for you um, than he had, you know, that he did for Boston. Um, they clear all, all the the cap space in Boston as Philly takes on everything, which is great. Um, you still have a thirteen and a half million dollar option for the 2017 season, so that's what Philadelphia is going to end up paying. 
Um, and they go to free agency this year. So if he struggles, you know, you're out one year, but you get a, a proven major league pitcher for a very young prospect to, you know, if he comes through, maybe the Phillies, you know, can play spoiler or be, you know, kind of one of those, those hidden gems that comes up at the tail end and maybe makes, you know, a run or gets very close to sniffing one of those wild card spots. No, I, I think that, uh, that this is probably good for Philly. I don't know that this is, that, that this is going to be something that, that gets them into wild card contention. Um, they had a rough year last year, um, and I'm not sure that Clay Buckholz is the guy that's, that's going to push him over that hump. Um, and Clay Buckholz had a rough year last year, like you said. The guy, he had a 478 ERA. He pitched in 37 games, started 21 of them, and only won eight. He lost 10. Uh, he, he's, he only pitched 139 innings, so he's not going deep into games. Um, it, it's just and keep in mind, part of that he was moved to the bullpen as well, and there was a stretch there where he was pen bound and then kept getting pulled back because of injuries to a lot of the arms in that rotation. Right, but we're also talking about a guy who has been struggling mightily for the last three years. Uh, ever since he had that really great season in 2013, where he finished with 12 wins, he only had one loss, he took some no decisions, but he only started 16 games. And had a 1.74 ERA. Ever since then, he's had these problems. Uh, 2014, he goes eight and 11, starts 28 games, only pitches 170 innings, and has a 5.34 ERA. Uh, the following year, in 2015, he uh, he uh, goes seven and seven with 500 record, but he started 18 games, so he's getting a lot of no decision. Only only pitches 113 innings and has a 3-2-6 ERA. And then, of course, last year where he went 8-10 and 10 with a 4-7-8. So he's been struggling a lot. Um, but this is sort of indicative of him. Um, he's, he's always been that kind of 4-5 guy. He's never going to be a 1-2 starter. Um, so as long as Philly doesn't expect 1-2-3 from him, then I think – he's going to help them. Um, if they do decide that he needs to be in that, in that three slot even, I think that they're going to find that uh, they, they get in a little bit of trouble there. Clearly. And, you know, the way that he ended the, the year, we said, you know, multiple moves to the bullpen. Um, you know, one of his big things is, uh, mainly in 2015, it was one of his best seasons, eight and a half strikeouts per nine, just under two walks per nine. Um, I mean, really a quality two or three starter. That was when uh, John Lester was still there, you know, sitting behind him. You know, I mean, it, it made sense. This year, on top of that four seven eight ERA, six strikeouts per nine innings and three and a half walks per nine. So, you know, he, he's not finding the zone, and he admitted as such. The one that you have to worry about, and you got to hope that in Philadelphia it doesn't hurt you as bad. You know, the 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 tough thing in a place like Boston is, yeah, you have, you have the huge wall and left the Green Monster, but you had that really short porch on pesky pole and right field is what made David Ortiz so damn dangerous. But, it, you, you know, Buck Colts came in, and, and he was a guy who generated grounders on over half the balls that were put in play against him. This year, 41% of the baseballs put in play were ground balls. So guys are putting the ball in the air. They're getting good contact, which pretty much indicates he's missing location, probably missing location up which is going to get you hit, which is going to get you knocked out of games quick, and it's going to put your team in a big hole. And if this trend continues, this Phillies team clearly does not have the bats that the Red Sox have to get out of those holes. The big thing that they are doing, though, is they are signing veteran players to sort contracts, at least you know, try and continue to groom the young guys you have in the farm system, give them guys they can learn from, but you can get rid of a lot of contracts in the next year or two to save space for the guys that you want to bring up and hopefully make a big splash in free agency in the next couple of seasons. Yeah. But Clay Buckholz isn't the only pitcher making news this week. Yvonne Nova is also making some news this week. Um, yep. You know, he's, he's signing with Pittsburgh, um, pulls him out of the free agent market, signs with Pittsburgh, and um, – 
kind of kind of uh, as a side note, this really disappoints another team in Major League Baseball, and that's the Seattle Mariners, who made a run at Ivan Nova, um, leading up to him signing with the with the uh, <clears throat> excuse me with the Pirates this week. So, Ivan Nova, who pitched pretty well, I mean, he pitched better yeah. early. He in pitched his better when he went York. to Pittsburgh. Yeah, he right. pitched better when he went to Pittsburgh. But that Tommy John surgery, he did not come back strong at all last year in pinstripes. And I, I think that you know you saw the resurgence, uh, you know, with the Bucks, and I, I think it's a good move to grab him for a. I mean, for $26 million for three years and a $2 million signing bonus, I mean, that's, you know, and he gets $2 million per season and performance bonuses. I mean, I think that's a solid, a solid play for both sides. He turns 30 in, you know, a month, so he still has, you know, relatively young in the arm. We'll see how the elbow holds up. I think it makes sense for both sides. Right. I think as long as he can continue the comeback um, – I think it was a great pickup for both sides. I think that uh, that it's a great deal for the Pirates. I think it's a great deal for Yvonne Nova, especially since Nova has been struggling with uh, with coming back from that surgery. But Yvonne Nova needs to continue his comeback. Um, he did pitch much better for the Pirates than he did for the Yankees. Hopefully he can continue that trend pitching in the National League to get better and better. Uh, exactly. And, you know... There have been uh, some rumors about Andrew McCutcheon that are continuing to grow. We're not going to get into those now because they're just that. They're rumors. But let's see what the Pirates are going to do. Obviously, they want to be contenders, but they're in one of the roughest divisions in Major League Baseball and the NL Central. You have the Cardinals who are making moves to go ahead you know, and try and, and get back to being their normal contender uh, you know, selves as a franchise. And, of course, the Cubs are expected to you know, I mean, just dominate again. So we'll see, you know, it, it was, he had, he, I will say this, um, he did have one of his best wins above replacement in Pittsburgh. Granted, it was only 11 games, um, but he ended up putting up a 1.4 war for them uh, with, you know, one of the best whips that we've seen. You know, it was 1.1, granted, not a whole season, but I think a change of scenery, a lot less pressure. Because that's the thing too, you know, he's going to get pressure from that, from that media base in New York. So it's a chance for him to kind of, you know, find a new find a new home, get a fresh start, and see where he goes from there. Speaking of fresh homes, though, uh, there's one guy who we are still waiting to find out if he's going to get a fresh home, and it sure doesn't look like anybody wants to make the move to grab him because who in the world wants to give up a first round pick for Jose Bautista? And I'm not saying that in a in a rude or condescending way, but as we said, an older guy, he has a qualifying offer, uh, just over $17 million from Toronto, which he rejected, and nobody seems to really be making an effort to try and sign him because you'd have to give up that first-round pick. And, I mean, I wouldn't, you wouldn't make a trade for Joey Batts and give up a first-round pick, so why would you give up one just to sign him to your team? It doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's starting to look more and more now uh, as he's come out and saying he would be willing to consider a one-year deal that he might be heading back to Toronto, which, to be fair, really seems like the most logical place from the beginning for me. And after you see Encarnacion for sure gone, he's not coming back, it gives you a chance to bring back a guy who, granted, you know, his struggles, his personality, all that is documented. Um, but the things that he has done, the bat flip, you know, a, a lot of the, the big moments that he has had in Toronto – has kind of made him the hometown son. I think it makes out it makes the most sense to bring him back on a one year deal that would probably end his career. They're not. I doubt they give him a qualifying offer again next year unless he does better than he did this past season. And then you know, I mean, if he wants to go and, and see their greener pastures, he can go for it. But to me, Toronto makes sense because you still want to have someone that has some semblance of power, um, and you still have Josh Donaldson. You're going to get a little bit older with veterans, but I don't know where else would he go. I, I can't think of anywhere else who's, who'd be willing to give a pick for him. And I can't think of any reason why anybody would give up a pick for him. Um, even last year, through all the media hype and the frenzy and the, 
getting punched in the face and all the things that happened with him last year, um, he still talked more than he walked. Guy hit 234, he was on base 366, slugged 452, OPS 817, not good numbers. Take that, take that um, even further when you find out that he walked 87 times, struck out 103 times. Then you look at him, yeah, he hit 22 home runs, but he only knocked across 69. So somehow, in the midst of all that, he still finished eighth in the MVP voting. Uh, I'm sorry, that was the year before. That's right, because he didn't, he didn't get anywhere near. He didn't sniff the MVP voting last year. So what no, makes it's, him it's, it's Christmas, Chris. Be nice a little bit. Come on, now. Get, be nice. It's what, Christmas season. What makes him think that he deserves a top-tier type contract? He should have been looking one year. He should have, he should have dropped to his knees and thanked the, the Toronto Blue Jays for a $17 million qualifying offer. The fact that he might actually play baseball next year is – probably a gift from for Christmas because <laughs> right now it doesn't, his numbers look like a guy who needs to retire. Well, and, and I, this is the one thing I, I will say to that. And, and I get where you're coming from and, and yeah, it, his numbers don't translate to what he wants. Um, the spot that's going to hurt him a lot is that he's already gone ahead and rejected that qualifying offer. Yet, let me ask you this. When I, you know, if I, if I read you these numbers, I want you to tell me what your first inclination is, just off the top of your head. 295 batting average, a 337 on base, slugging of 513 with 29 home runs and 93 RBI. When you hear those numbers, how much do you think a player like that would be worth? Just in your mind. Um... I mean, there's there's so much more that goes into it. How old is the guy? I, I, I it, it, let's put age aside. Just off the numbers itself, I, I get there's a lot more, but just just ballpark me a number, J- just just for giggles. Uh, eighteen million a year, maybe three okay. four years. That was Carlos Beltran, who got a one year sixteen million dollar deal from the Astros. So how are you going to take a guy who performed? across the board worse than him and and try and pay him more money. So now that he's rejected that qualifying offer and it doesn't seem like anybody's going to pick it up, the question is, will he go back? Because now he wants more than the qualifying offer. He wants roughly about uh, 17.2 million, something roughly greater than that, which doesn't make a lick of sense. So he really shot himself in the foot by trying to hold off and be a little bit more greedy I think in the end it's going to end up backfiring on him and probably losing him three or four million dollars. Matt Holiday, okay, thirteen year or thirteen thirteen years, good God, thirteen million on one year, and he hit two forty six with a three twenty two on base, a four sixty one slugging, one homer and twenty ribbies in one hundred and ten games, injured most of the year. So you can't tell me that Jose Bautista is going to garner more money than especially Carlos Beltran, who, I mean, you know, I believe what he, he, he went to, uh, to the Rangers, if I'm not mistaken, and kind of, you know, helped push them into the postseason last year, although they were already strong. He doesn't have anything to back up what he wants aside from just that. It's what he wants, and it doesn't fit what the market is. I would be very surprised if he gets it, and I don't see any way a team's going to give up a first-round compensatory pick for those kind of statistics. It makes no sense. No, not at all. And this goes, this all feeds into his sort of his own, his being a legend in his own mind and his, his sort of attitude that he has, the reason why he flips the bat the way he does. He thinks he's a better ball player than he is. And right. he's just, he's just not. And I think that um, one of the things that you have to watch out for is not only does he think that he's better than he is, but he thinks he's better than everybody else too. And that really starts to rub on guys in the locker room. And we know for a fact that Jose Bautista rubs on guys the wrong way in the locker room. That, that didn't come out quite how I meant it. We know that Jose Bautista rubs guys people. the wrong way. Yeah. He, he, he has a very, uh, very abrasive personality. I mean, yes. at least to that, we talked about it, you know, with umpires as well. 
Um, you know, I mean, that comes across on the field plenty of times. And, you know, when you get to a point, and I go back to an ejection that happened a year or two ago, uh, I believe in Kansas City, and Jerry Mills ejected him um, in a tie ball game for arguing balls and strikes. And Jerry Mills gave him plenty. He let him say his piece, told him, okay, knock it off. And he wouldn't knock it off, and he got dumped. And John Gibbons comes out, and normally you stand up for your own player. You, you, know, you say something. He turned, looked at Jerry, grabbed Bautista, and just walked away. I mean, when your manager can't even come back you up, yeah. And, and the way that he acts clearly is, I mean, it, it, it's glaringly obvious that he thinks that he deserves more calls and, and is a guy that doesn't make mistakes. Man, you are in a game that is predicated on failure. And you are failing, what, 77% of the time. Right. If you want to make 15, 16 million, then start putting up numbers where you're failing 72% of the time? 280 that average? That's, you know? I mean, it, you know, it, it, so yeah, it, it, it just doesn't. I, I get what he wants, and, you know, maybe at some point in his career when he was younger, he could have gone, he could have gotten away with asking for that much money, but at this point, no way. Well, and we're talking about a guy who's never, he, he's, he, he's had one 300 average season. One season. And, I mean, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to call the guy out on his, on the way he plays baseball. I don't want to call the guy out on, on, uh, you know, things that may or may not have happened in his career, but it's very, it's very suspect to me that a guy whose first two years in the major leagues, he hit zero home runs, um, then jumps to suddenly he's hitting well, 60. Yeah, but I mean, then all of a sudden let's, he's hitting 55 let's not be, Yeah, I mean, but I get it. Let's not be, you know, I mean, let's not be, I don't want to be that, you know, that guy. No, um, not, I don't want to accuse the guy of anything, but, know, I, want to under, but I, I want to understand from, from a baseball perspective how a guy goes from hitting no home runs to hitting 55 home runs Hitting no home runs at 23, to hitting 55 home runs at well. Keep in 30. mind, I mean, I mean, I mean, Mark Trumbo was do, did very well in Los Angeles. Went to Arizona and really kind of just fell off. And then Baltimore last year had a career year. I mean, so it, it can happen. I'm, I, I'm not trying to be the you know the, the naive guy who's saying, well, it, no way he juiced. But I mean, it, it can happen. I don't want to start a rhetoric that maybe he did it. it let that for fans and other guys to decide. I will say this though, and Joey Bats, all due respect, man, but I, I got to throw this out there because I'm I just got to. You know that you know what else has, has happened one time in his career? What's that? He got punched in the face on the base path. So moving on. Um, <laughs> one thing I wanted to get to, and and this was based off of the video that we released this week on uh, on Out of Left Field, hosted by Chris and Graham on Facebook, as well on. Uh, the Out of Left Field uh, YouTube channel, Out of Left Field, hosted by Chris and Graham there as well. The easiest way uh, to find it is a huge story that came up, not from baseball, but from the NCAA football. Okay, And I'm sure many of you have heard it. I, it took me probably a day or two to wrap my head on what the hell actually happened. But a, a Wake Forest Demon Deacon lifer player was a coach. Apparently, when the new coaching regime came in, was not retained as a coach, moved off to the uh, to the radio booth, and was just really ticked off that he didn't get retained uh, on the coaching staff, and started funneling plays to opposing teams. It, we're not going to talk a lot of football here. There is one thing as two soldiers that I think Chris and I both want to say. And that is that Army was implicated in this. And I'm not sure how deep it has run. I have not heard everything on how deep it has run. Um, but I will say this. I don't call for coaches to get fired. I, I think it's, you know, it's rough. It happens. It's part of the job. When you sign up to be a coach, you know that you are hired to be fired. But if the coaching staff at Army, and, and if you can figure out where it went, to the head coach, below, whomever it was, if they are proven to have accepted plays like that from Wake Forest and also did not report it, you have to fire them. And, I'm, and, and I get that Bobby Petrino was fined in Louisville, all that, and that's great. And I'm not – you can say it's a double standard. 
This is the military. This is the United States Army. This is the, I mean, this is the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. You are held to the seven Army values, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And all of those you break by accepting something like this. And how can you be expected to lead, what, 70-plus cadets on a football team when they look at you and go, well, you broke the tenets of these Army values, so why in the world do I need to follow it? You, you right. can't have you can't have that in the academy. And and these are these are going to be guys who may be playing football now, but when they graduate, they're going to be young lieutenants in the United States Army, probably on active duty. A lot of these guys are probably going to go into the infantry, and you can't have them come from an environment where it's okay to sidestep those army values. Those army values not only are they designed to make you more professional and, and keep you from becoming the type of enemy that, that we see now in groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but they're also designed to keep you alive. The, these, are, these are things that, that feed directly into discipline, and discipline is directly related to keeping you alive in combat. And, you know, you can call it hazing, you can call it whatever you want, but all of the things that happen when you're a cadet or when you're a, when you're a new enlisted soldier and you go to basic training, all of those things that happen to teach you discipline as, as, as ridiculous as they may sound. It might sound ridiculous to, to, you know, make a guy mop the parking lot in the rain because he didn't mop the floor after you told him three times. But guess what? He's never going to not mop the floor after you tell him. And that means that in combat, he's never going to not do what you tell him right when you tell him to do it. It may sound ridiculous, biggest... but all of this feeds into a culture of discipline. And when you break yep. that discipline, you break the discipline in the future. You start getting used and, and, to not being undisciplined, and it's dangerous. Yeah, I mean, in the biggest way, and you know, people think maybe we just kind of spout it off, these army values. No, they are in order. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service honor, integrity, and personal courage. Why? L-B-R-S-H-I-P. The Army values are meant to teach, instill leadership. You cannot have that kind of leadership at an academy. Now, as I step off the soapbox and Chris and I take a step down and we kind of take a breath, the big thing I wanted to know is what the hell would happen if this, if this same thing occurred in Major League Baseball, Chris? I, I don't think there would be near the outrage. Now, granted, as I said on the video you know, it, baseball is kind of the gentleman's game. There are hundreds of unwritten rules, and baseball polices itself. Sign stealing is a part of the game. Apparently, from what I just found out, Little League uh, has basically banned sign stealing if it's found out it's an immediate ejection, which, as an umpire, I'm not going looking for it. And if you find it, if it happens in, in Major League Baseball, for the most part, even when guys know it, like Yasmani Grandal, so that he knew that Ben Zobris was stealing signs in, uh, in the NLCS. Guess whose fault that is? You guys for either not catching it faster or not changing them. And guys like Russell Martin have even said, yeah, it ticks me off they were doing it, but what pisses me off even more is I didn't notice it in time until way too late. So uh, sign stealing it in a, is a hole on the field between the lines I have absolutely zero problem with. I agree. It's the guys that get binoculars and look in from the bullpen. It's the guys who have a light switch like the 1980s Chicago Cubs and would flip a light on when it was a fastball and leave it off when it was a curveball or vice versa. Um, right. you know, but, Chris, tell me, I, I, I'm curious as a player, and, and this is clearly not the same thing because offensively it's mano a mano. You know, maybe you have a, a steal sign here and there, hit and run, put a bunt down, whatever it might be. But if this type of behavior, if these actions happened, if team personnel shared signs, whatever it may be, you know, shifts, whatever, with other defensive personnel, I mean, how, I don't say how would that be received, but I guess what would the outcome be? I mean, you're going to see shifts and things, but, you know, to me, signs are easily changed, but if you don't know that they, if you don't know that they figured it out and it gives you that advantage, I mean, where would you see Major League Baseball go if this ended up happening? Well, first of all, um, tell, show me where it doesn't happen. I mean, 
there's a lot of moves in baseball, right? I mean, guys are moving around all the time. You think that guys don't get a little bit uh, jaded or maybe upset with the team that trades them and they don't want to be traded? Absolutely that happens. You think they don't go straight to their hitting coach or straight to their manager and say, hey, by the way, you know, if he touches his right shoulder and then his right forearm and his right shoulder and his right forearm, they're going to put a, they're going to put a double steal on. You should probably watch out for that. Yeah, I'm sure that happens. Now, well, I, 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 think think it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit different here. I mean, that happens in the NFL all the time. We see teams sign a player just so they can have information. I'm, I'm thinking right. more if, if team personnel who is currently on that team gives information to a new team, you know, while still working for Team A. Um, I think that Major League Baseball as a whole, um, I mean, they could violate them on, on the integrity of, of that and, and possibly find them. But I think personally, if I was, if I was, uh, if I was uh, Rob Manfred, I would, I would let the teams handle that because basically that's between the team and the player. If the player's willing or another coach on the team is willing to put the team at jeopardy by giving away signs, they need to be prepared to accept punishments. And I think that uh, Major League Baseball needs to give them the latitude to do that. You know, obviously you can't cancel contracts. Obviously you can't, you know, um, you, you can't do several things. You have to pay guys or you can find guys, but um, for coaching staff, fire them. Absolutely. Um, for players, bench them. I mean, you know, sometimes a game or two on the bench and then that information in the public sphere is enough for them to realize, hey, I really messed up. I shouldn't have done that. You put them on the bench for a couple of games, maybe 10 games, and, you know, you maybe even create – a, uh, an, an injury to put them on the 10 day DL bench them. Don't let them play the game um, and bring somebody up to replace them so that they understand that not only they are replaceable, uh, but that that kind of a, that kind of those kinds of actions aren't acceptable. If you're going to steal signs um, when you're standing on second base and, and you can see uh, what the catcher's doing, you can see what the base coaches are, uh, what the, what the manager's doing in the, in the dugout. And you know, and you want to relay that to one of the players on your team, fine. I got no problem with that. If you're a first or third base coach and you hear the manager say something and you want to relay that to somebody on your team, fine. I got no problem with that. But if you're, if you're a hitting coach and you send an email to a manager of another team telling them, hey, this is our sign. these are our signs, just so you know, I have a huge problem with that. I think baseball right. should and, have and, and let's be And I mean, let's be honest – Baseball is, is probably the most well, mentally taxing game. I think golf is one of the most mentally taxing sports. But, you know, I mean, how many times have we seen a batter calls time, steps out of the box just to mess with uh, the pitcher's timing? A runner takes an extra step off of first just to make him think. Well, if you start doing things just to make the pitcher think you've got a sign, now you force a catcher to stop, change rhythm, change signs, get in his head, he has to start thinking more. I mean, it's something that will never be fully legislated out of the game, and I don't think it can be, because if you try and do that, you're going to change the fabric of the game as a whole. I've heard people say they don't like uh, you know, the overall idea of stealing signs unsportsmanlike. I, I, get, I, I get the idea that, yeah, you know, it, it feels unsportsmanlike, but no, at the end of the day, it's, it's just part of the game. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful part of the game, to be honest, I think. As a player, when I was standing on second base or I was standing on first base, and I, if I could see the catcher's signs to the pitcher and I could figure out what he was throwing, it gave me an advantage, and I wanted that advantage because, you know, I want to steal on – excuse me. I want to steal on a breaking ball that's going to be down, down and in. I want to steal on a slider that's going to be low and outside because the catcher's going to have to move – to pick right. those pitches up, it's going to give me that split second that I need possibly to get to second base. I don't want to or steal. Or for you and me, like two or three extra seconds to get to. <laughs> well, not when I was in high school. When I was in high school, I was actually pretty fast. But um, it's going to give me that, that extra time that I need, that jump that I need. And right. it's going to let me know that the pitcher's probably not coming over to me. Um, 
And, and, and I mean, catchers I know this too. This I mean, out, then, you know, right? And, and catchers catch know it. I mean, how many times do we see now on the team? You know, and, and actually, it was talked about this year. You get to zoom in on, on on the eyes of the catcher, and his eyes are always flicking up at the batter because he wants to see is he looking down between that arm, you know, trying to get you know get a catch of what you know what sign I'm flashing. So I mean. I mean, they understand that it's there, and I don't think it's a thing that's ever going to be legislated out of the game. Um, I certainly hope do? it Tell never goes. Tell them not goes... to look down. I mean, that doesn't yeah, make any sense. I mean, I, right. I, I certainly hope that it never comes down to what happened at Wake Forest. I think it's it's horrific. He has um, – Tommy Elrod has absolutely ruined uh, his career. Uh, I mean, I won't say he ruined his life, but his reputation, everything about him in the football world and that university has been <laughs> shattered and will never get put back together. He's probably never going to coach again, anyway. No, no way. That could be that could be a life changing thing. How and and I mean, and, and, and it's changed things for media personnel as a whole because now media personnel is losing. You know, they're losing some of their access to teams and walkthroughs and practices because now there's a trust. You know, there's a trust that has been broken. You know, across the board. Granted, this is a, you know team to team, but um, yeah, it definitely changes things. So, guys, a reminder: we are part of the Grueling Truth Network. Love being on the Grueling Truth with these guys. Check out thegruelingtruth.net. All kinds of uh, college football shows. We're going to break down all the bowl games for you. If you're into your last week or two of your fantasy football uh, season and you've got to figure out who's going to beat who, unfortunately, Chris and I had the two best records and lost last week. So now we're going head-to-head for third place. So we are the worst loser. Um, but check out for fantasy football, college football. Obviously, the NFL is there getting down to the last couple of weeks and all your other good stuff. That's thegruelingtruth.net, where legends speak. Guys, we are nearing an hour, so we are going to make the long trip west. Well, I'm going to make the long trip west since Chris is already there, and we're going to start breaking down our first two teams in the American League division on the west side. So that's going to bring us to number one, the Texas Rangers and the Oakland Athletics at the bottom end of that division. Let's... Let's go ahead and knock this one out quick. Uh, this one out quick, uh, and I don't mean to be rude here. I'm not trying to be, you know, overly funny. But we don't have the time to go into all the things that the A's need because I mean they are they have been so far removed. And I mean, and, and the sad thing is, I mean, you know, they were what I mean, uh, you know, a, a couple, an inning or two away two years ago for making it into the ALDS. And then it just, you know, I think the Royals ended up, I think it was the Royals ended up beating them. And then after, I mean, it just, everything kind of just, you know, imploded. Uh, the surprising one is that, you know, Mr. Moneyball himself, Billy Bean, actually, like, like you said earlier in the show, made a pretty hefty run at Edwin Encarnacion. I don't blame him for not going there. They are a, uh, not even a team in flux. They are a team that doesn't really have an identity. Um, and, right. and, and that's really kind of what the scary part is. You know, right now they're projected um, at, at, you know, at, at a $65 million payroll. They did last year $84 million. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, they're, they're paying guys, you know, large amounts of money and a good chunk of their players are 30, you know, you know 30 and over. I mean, you know, they don't they don't have they don't have the talent right now. I'm sorry to say, they don't have the age, and they don't have enough people to build around to actually pay money to. Who wants to go there? I mean, they're a team that's fighting with their own city, just trying to get a stadium that is that is safe and and enjoyable to play in. I mean, you have sewage back up in your bullpen, or, or rather in your dugout. It doesn't make you really want to go where you know the bright whites. Well. Let me caveat this by saying that I'm an A's fan also. Um, I grew up watching the A's. Obviously, the A's and the Giants are right across the bay from each other. Um, and A guy who was there was, for the earthquake. I, I was there for the earthquake. Um, I, was, I, I, was in the stadium. I, was, I was in the stadium watching the teams warm up prior to the earthquake. Um, and I like the A's. I really do. And when I was a kid... After the strike in 95, you go to A's games cheap. The, the Giants didn't, didn't do this, but the A's, if you bought an adult ticket anywhere in the stadium, you could buy a kid's ticket for a dollar anywhere in the stadium. So I sat behind first base, behind home plate quite a bit in 1996. 
um, watching the A's play. And I was an adult before I ever equaled the number of, um, of A's games that I went to as a kid as Giants games that I went to because it was less expensive to go to the A's and the A's players were more fun a lot of times to watch. The, the Giants struggled in the 90s. I was still a huge Giants fan, but the A's players knew that they sort of had this, this inkling that the, that the, the strike had been a mistake that baseball was struggling and they were willing to come out and sign autographs. They were willing to come out and talk to fans before the game during batting practice. It was a lot of fun. And you got to talk to guys like Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco and Ricky Henderson and, you know, all of these big name guys who used to play for the A's. However, that was 30, that was 20 years ago, right? This is not the A's of 1996 or 1989 or, or, you know, 1987, these are the age of 2016, and they need a lot of, uh, of work. And it yeah. starts at the very top. I know you, you're saying, yes, they're fighting with Oakland to get a stadium. You and I have had this conversation. I don't believe in tax dollars going to pay for stadiums for billionaires. I think that um, the A's owners need to stop being so cheap. They need to start playing, paying players. They need to build their own stadium because – Let's face it, the A's haven't given Oakland a reason to build them a stadium. They have been terrible for 20 years. Yeah, I so, mean, the only bashing going on is not the bash brothers, it's just bashing the team and the management and the, the lack of production that you've seen. I mean, hell, they had, the, uh, they had the, the, the fifth worst batting average in the bigs last year at, at you know, a 246 team average. That ties in with the New York Mets. So what do the A's really need to do? Quite simple. They need pitching, they need fielding, and they need hitting. Those are the three things that the A's need. Unfortunately, those are the three components of baseball, and they have none of them. So moving on from the Oakland Athletics, let's talk about the best team in the American League rest, and that's the Texas Rangers. What do the Texas Rangers really need to do, Graham? Well, to be fair, they've done it. I mean, for the most you know, they've added some veteran pieces, which you want to see. Um, you know, Luke Roy stays. Uh, I mean, their payroll is going to be – is expected to be about $162 million, which is right below where they were last year. There's, there's rumors in here that they're going to end up re-signing Josh Hamilton uh, to, a, um, to a minor league deal, which is, which is good for him personally. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, as a, as a player, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that, that his best years are behind him. The biggest thing that I like that they've done, obviously they, they signed Carlos Gomez. Um, we'll see what that ends up bringing. He's 31 years old. Uh, but, had, you know, had a, a semi-decent year, 231. He, Gomez is very, very similar to a Jose Bautista. You know, he's kind of, you know, kind of get, gets hot-headed, um, definitely a big bat, but not a guy who's going to put up uh, you know, a huge average for you. The one that I want to see if it pans out, and, and I, I sincerely hope that it does, is A, are we going to see Joey Gallo playing first base? Is he going to be more productive? Uh, or is he going to stay in that DH role as Ryan Rue is playing first base? And, and had a decent year last year. But the big one to me is the signing of Andrew Kashner. Um, once again, the Marlin, or, or uh, you know, uh, the Marlins are, are proving Chris's point. Unfortunately, much to my chagrin, um, you know, that the, I mean, that they're acquiring pieces and then doing nothing with them. They acquire uh, Kashner last year for three players. One of those being Matt Caps, a hard throwing right hander, kind of the the jumper as we've always called him. Um, and he didn't do that well last year um, in Miami. He went one and four, just under a six ERA in 12 games. Um, you know, started 11. I mean, just it, it wasn't impressive through 52 innings. Um, you know, I mean, just you know, his, the, his average against was a 3.01. Um, I mean, the worst uh, of his career, at least for the team, 2.79, which matches uh, what he did last year in San Diego. But now you've got a guy who, uh, very similar, to, you know, to guys kind of like Arietta, guys who've had a lot of, they've had promise, and you never know if they're really going to reach it. If he can reach the potential that he has, and he can be 
that number three or even a solid number four behind Cole Hamels and you Darvish as Darvish is back, should be back healthy the whole year. I mean, you know, there is definitely a good possibility here. Um, oh, I think the Rangers will repeat as American League East champions. Shinsu Chu yeah. is in right field. He at 242. You know, uh, he's getting older. He's almost 34. So the question is then, you know, Jerks and Profar, Joey Gallo, do you start finding ways to move them around to try and put them in the lineup more? And are they going to phase Chu out as he is getting older? Uh, you know, I, I don't – I mean, he's clearly not going to, you know, be an all-star anymore. He played – um, 48 games last year, hampered by injury. You know, I, I mean, you know, he's clearly almost to home plate on his career. Um, but I mean, you tell me, I, that's where I'm at. And I know we, we've mentioned pitching a lot, and I think the Cashner move is a subtle move that that could pay off very, very uh, big dividends for them. But I mean, what do you see? I, I know you you always mentioned Adrian Beltre is kind of the key piece there. He's on the the tail end as well. So, I mean, what do you, what do you, in your opinion, do the Rangers need to do to repeat or at least get beyond the ALDS next year? I mean, they got embarrassed in the ALDS by the Blue Jays. So there are a few things that I think that the Rangers need to do. First and foremost, they need to get rid of Joey Gallo. Joey Gallo needs to be traded. They need to do it before his stock drops so low that he's not worth having anymore. Because it's become quite obvious that Joey Gallo's ability to hit in AAA has not translated to the majors. He's feast or famine at the plate. He's he's just not the kind of everyday ball player that the Rangers need. Um, I think that they need to, while his stock is still high as as, as a uh, prospect, they need to get everything that they can for him. And when I say get everything that they can for him, I mean they need to get arms for him. If that means pitching prospects, if that means pitchers, if that means take a run at, at Quintana uh, from, from, uh, sh- from Chicago White Sox and see if right. you can put together a Quintana Gallo deal with maybe a couple other pieces, um, they need to do that. Because right now, Cole Hamels and you Darvish – are all that they have really in the bullpen or in the, in the, in the rotation. Right. And consistent at least. Right. Right. And that's not enough. A one and two guy aren't enough, especially when you Darvish has now experienced two seasons where he is injury prone. He's on again, off again. I mean, you Darvish being a Japanese player is going to be older than your average American ball player because he has to wait that, that, what is it, 10 years before uh, he I think, becomes? yeah, seven or eight years. Yeah, it, I think it's seven or eight years. Um, yeah, he, well, I mean, but he, he's 30 years old. So um, I, I want to look back, you know, he, you know, when he came over, uh, he came over, uh, I believe, in, in, in 2012. So he right. would have been 26 years old. So, yeah, I guess eight years before I started playing when he was 18 years old. So, um, so he came in, he got a little bit of a late start like other – other ball players that we've, that we've talked about from Japan, but he's starting to fall into this rut where he did, he's getting hurt and it's not good. Um, right. Well, and the same thing we saw with Tanaka, I mean, they get used so much, you know I mean? Cause you know, those guys believe in, I can go out there tomorrow. I can go out there the next day. It's no big deal. Um, right. And that doesn't translate well into the major league game. The other thing that they need to focus on is, when, when you're going to start dishing guys out to get arms and you're going to start dishing guys out to get prospects, you need to look for some speed because they don't have any speed on the base pass, this team. I mean, where they got tw- two guys with 20 steals last year, everybody else, Elvis, barely, even broke, everybody else barely even broke 10. Yeah, Elvis I mean, Andrews with 24, and uh, even Ruth Odor had 14. Um, right. right. So, yeah, I mean – there definitely is a is a lack of of quickness. Trade Joey Gallo to get to get as many arms as you can for him. Develop your bullpen, fill out your rotation, and look for some speed on the base path. Those are the things that they need to do that are going to get them over the hump because those are the things that they're not doing right right now. I will say I am very surprised at you saying trade Gallo. Much as we praised them for the moves that they made last year for being able to hold on to Gallo and hold on to Profar. 
Um, I am surprised. I, I, I would like to see him get um, you know a little bit more time under his belt. I mean, he's played in what 53 total games. Um, you know, his average is 173. But we've seen guys. You know, things haven't been as consistent for him. He's more of a third baseman. That's where Adrian Beltre is. He struck out 19 times in 17 games with with the Rangers last season. That's just not. I mean, he struck out 150 times in AAA. He's, he's so hot and cold, even in AAA, that I just feel like keeping him is a, is a, is a liability because I don't think he's going to translate to the, to the majors. I mean, I don't think that he's going to be able to make that transition to being a major league hitter. And before all the other teams in the league realize that, they need to dish him. I understand your point there. I don't fully agree. Um, I, I get you know, the numbers don't look great, and, and, and maybe um, you know maybe it will be the best. I mean, I, I think a piece that, that you can look at to kind of gauge what will end up happening there is Aaron Judge of the New York Yankees. Uh, 26 games played in last year, a 179 batting average, and struck out um, 42 times and walked nine. So, you know, I mean, clearly, you know, I mean, on, a, on, a, on a full season average, he would have struck out 252 times and walked 54. So, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. If, if it was – if I had the option and, and you can at least get – if you have the time to hold him and try and see at least one – you know, see how he can progress, I would do it. I don't think that they trade him right away before the, before the spring. I think you at least get a feel of what you're going to see in spring training – if he if he's showing better, if he's improving, you keep him. You build a and I'm not saying build around him, but if he can improve and Adrian Beltre goes and you have him and Profar as two young players, and they can at least be productive. I, I, I don't I don't think that he's a piece that you trade trade right away. Now yeah. if 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 we he's come to the trade prone. deadline, he's error prone and he's what, feast or famine at the plate. I don't think he's a guy that you keep. I don't think he's a guy. If you if, if if we get to the trade deadline and they are in the same spot that they were this past season and he still isn't playing much, A, because of production and also because of what they have currently there, then, you know what, trading him may be the right call. I just don't know if I would do it right now after really, you know, one, you know, one season where he's had maybe a, you know, a half season of gameplay, uh, you know, total. I, 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 I get what you're saying, but not every guy is going to come in and light it up. Sure. I, but I, I, I think that while his stock is hot, I would make a huge run at a big-name pitcher. That's all I'm saying. Well, uh, Quintana has been – his name has been thrown around. Um, that is something that I, I think we will be talking about coming up here very shortly on the show. Um, several teams, mainly in uh, the East, are being discussed. Um, he's been a, a hot commodity, A, you know, because of, uh, of what he has shown in Chicago and also because of how much control and, uh, you know, and, and, and the, um, the small amount – of what his contract and how team friendly his contract actually is. Right. Guys. And I think that, I think that um, yep. next week when we, when we move on to the other teams in, in the West, we're going to really talk about one of the more exciting teams in the West. I think in my opinion, more exciting than the Rangers to watch. And that is the Seattle Mariners. Uh, you know, I, you said I actually I, I thought you were going to go with the Astros. I, I know, and I'm not being sarcastic here, but I mean, with, with the moves the Astros have made, the problem right now with, with the Mariners is they've made so many attempted to make so many big splashes, and nothing's happened with it. So I, I think the Astros are are certainly kind of going all in, going for broke here, uh, and we'll see what happens. But guys, uh, from again from 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 myself, from Chris, from everybody at the Grueling Truth, we wish you the happiest and safest of holidays a merry christmas to you and your family blessings on you all uh happy hanukkah happy boxing day again to those up north and uh we just pray everyone is is safe we see you guys next week we'll have plenty of more stuff for you on the show right before the new year here on out of left field